Thank you very much indeed, Russell. Thank you, and uh, Anne-Marie Organ for doing the technical work in allowing this uh, Zoom meeting to take place. Uh, and thank you to the Ecclesiastical Law Society for hosting uh, this evening's uh, book launch. Also, of course, thanks to the University of Bristol Press uh, for their collaboration in this evening's uh, event. Uh, it's a joy to be launching this book uh, this evening, uh, uh, written by our dear friend and colleague, Russell Sandberg, on religion and marriage law, the need for reform. Uh, and uh, it's a volume which I can say is both readable and affordable, as the previous slide just demonstrated. And it's very rare these days that one can say that of a, a legal text. Uh, and most book launches tend to consist of uh, warm white wine and twiglets, but we thought we could beat that this evening uh, by putting together a stellar panel of experts within the family law field who can uh, respond uh, to the book uh, by giving their thoughts and their uh, insights. Um, but I thought I would just say a brief word about what the book is intended to do by reference to the uh, introduction and to adopt uh, Professor Sandberg's uh, own words so that we have an idea of the context within which this volume is intended uh, to sit. Russell tells us this, the purpose of this book is to galvanize the, galvanize the need for reform by providing an accessible guide to the law as it currently stands, while arguing for the need for consolidation, modernization and reform, explaining why this is needed and how this could be achieved. It seeks to complement works on the topic, which are more academic in their nature. And Russell informs us that the book has three objectives. First, to explain and demystify the law. Second, to document and critically analyze the debate so far. And third, to suggest solutions uh, drawing upon the developing uh, uh, work of the uh, Law Commission in relation specifically to uh, weddings uh, law. Uh, and it follows that the book therefore falls into three broad sections. The legal framework is the first part, the road to reform is the second part, and reform proposals uh, comprise part three. And so to stress test that volume tonight, uh, we have an extremely impressive panel of experts within the field of family law. Uh, Baroness Hale of Richmond uh, has had a career of excellence, both in academia, within the Law Commission and on the bench, uh, leading to an appointment uh, uh, to the House of Lords, uh, uh, transmitting into the Supreme Court. Uh, and ending her stellar career as the president of the United Kingdom at Supreme Court. Uh, Professor Gillian Douglas uh, taught at Cardiff University and at Bristol University and elsewhere. Uh, she is or was the head of the law school at Cardiff, uh, following which she became head of the School of Law at King's College London. And she, as will be well known, has published extensively in the field of family law. Uh, and finally, we go north of the border, uh, uh, an area which I think regrettably in England and Wales, we tend to neglect, uh, bearing in mind the differences between family law uh, between the two jurisdictions. And I'm delighted that our third speaker this evening is Professor Jane Mayer, who is Professor of Private Law at the University of Glasgow and also head of the law school there. Uh, and um, she, will, she has a particular research interest within the field of family law about which she has also written uh, extensively. And the, the format for this evening is that each of those three speakers will spend 
about 10 minutes giving their personal reflections from one particular uh, angle. Uh, then I will ask Russell Sandberg to respond to those three uh, critical approaches to his work, uh, after which uh, I will invite members of the audience to uh, comment and question in a fairly freewheeling uh, discussion uh, as best we can, bearing in mind the numbers of people who are uh, present. Do please make use of the chat facility uh, to indicate questions that you may have. Uh, it might be helpful if you um, put the word question before so that it draws my attention to it and I can then try and put the questions and comments into a thematic order uh, when we come to that part. Uh, use that also for uh, comments more generally. Uh, and there's also the facility on Zoom to use a little yellow hand and the raised hand uh, will indicate that someone uh, wishes to make an observation. And I will do the best I can to make sure that everyone has the opportunity to speak if time allows, and that both the panelists and Russell have the opportunity to uh, respond. So enough from me, uh, let's crack on and hear from the uh, real experts. Uh, and I'm delighted that to go first from our panel of experts is Baroness Hale of Richmond, uh, Brenda Hale. Uh, thank you. Uh, I was beginning by congratulating Professor Sandberg for trying to galvanize debate on one of the most fundamental questions of family law, how to get married. I hope that he and the Law Commission will be more successful than the Law Commission was with its last attempt to take a holistic view of this subject, the report on solemnization of marriage in England and Wales way back in 1973. Like that report, this book is about ways of getting married, not about the status of being married. The state needs to know and who is not. The state also has an interest in encouraging as many people as possible to enter into a legal marriage. This is because marriage brings with it a host of legal benefits which other intimate relationships do not. The most important relate to inheritance and tax when one of them dies and to sharing out the family's assets if they split up. But for a husband, another major benefit is an automatic legal relationship with his wife's children. These benefits for the couple are also benefits for the state. They create their own little social security system in which the couple are expected to look after one another and their children. There's also some evidence that married relationships are more durable than unmarried ones, which is also a benefit for the state, if not always for the couple. Marriage can also bring social and psychological benefits. Its symbolic power is evidenced by the desire of so many same-sex couples to have the possibility of legal marriage, even after they had gained the possibility of civil partnership, which brings with it almost all the benefits of marriage. Yet fewer and fewer opposite-sex couples are getting married, while marriage is the fastest growing relationship among same-sex couples. Why don't people get married? There are some who are ideologically opposed. They see marriage as a heteronormative patriarchal relationship, which is not for them. Although they're not necessarily opposed to legal commitment, hence the campaign for opposite sex civil partnerships. There are also some who do plan to get married eventually, but don't see it as a priority just yet. Perhaps because they would prefer to save for a deposit on their first home, rather than for the lavish wedding ceremony that so many people seem to want. There are still a worrying number of people also who believe in the myth of the common law marriage, that in some magical way, a relationship is turned into legal marriage after a certain length of time. But of course, there are also the uneven relationships where one party would like to get married, but the other is not so keen. It takes two to tango. My suspicion is that that is the real reason for the retreat from marriage. All of this argues for making getting married as easy as possible for everyone who wants the benefits of marriage. It did used to be very simple if you knew how. My husband's and my divorce decrees came through on the 21st and 22nd of December, 1992. 
my daughter gave us a box of confetti for Christmas, which was an obvious hint. So on the 29th of December, when the registry office reopened, we booked a slot for New Year's Eve. There must have been a cancellation and gave the requisite one clear day's notice. We bought a wedding ring that day. We rang around friends and relations and asked them to come if they could. The room was pretty full. We devised our own wedding ceremony, which the registrar was happy to adopt as long as it contained the statutory declarations and there was nothing religious. We celebrated with smoked salmon sandwiches and champagne and a repurposed Christmas cake. It was all perfect. We could do that because I happen to know what the law was then. Later changes have been driven by immigration rather than family law considerations, so it's a bit more difficult now. But there is no doubt that the law is incredibly and unnecessarily complicated and restrictive. Two groups of people in particular are disadvantaged. One is those who go through a religious ceremonies of marriage, which do not make them legally married because the temple or mosque is not licensed for marriages or the right formalities are not completed. Yet many of these people may want to be married, not only in the eyes of their gods and their communities, but also in the eyes of the law. Some of them may realize that they are not and plan to have a separate civil ceremony, but never get round to it. Some of them may not realize that they are not legally married. Again, there may be an imbalance of power, especially between the sexes, where it suits one party not to be married in the eyes of the law. I think Professor Douglas will be saying more about the problem of religious non-marriages later. The other group are those who want neither a religious ceremony nor a civil ceremony as currently required. They want a humanist or secular ceremony conducted not by a cooperative registrar as ours was, but by their own celebrant. Quite how many of these people do not get married as a result, I'm not sure that we know. There's nothing to stop them having two ceremonies, but obviously they feel discriminated against because they have to have two ceremonies, whereas people who have either a religious or a civil ceremony only have to have one. And for some, this may be a deterrent. So what is the solution? The book proposes a simple system which would apply to all kinds of wedding, including those conducted according to the rights of the Church of England. Everyone would have to give 28 days notice. The purpose of this is presumably to allow steps to be taken to prevent invalid or sham marriages. All weddings would have to have a recognized officiant, not necessarily the same as the celebrant, but it could be. Officiants would be Church of England clergy, registrars, people put forward by their organizations, which might or might not be based on a religious religion or belief, and individuals who put themselves forward. Ceremonies could then take place anywhere and in any form, provided that it was clear that both parties consented to the marriage. The officiant would be responsible for ensuring that marriages were properly recorded. Legislation would clarify which marriages were valid, which void or voidable, and which did not amount to marriages at all. The difference being that void marriages do have some of the legal consequences of valid marriages, although not all. Such a system would fulfill the most important state interest, which is to know who is married and who is not. Whether it would encourage more people to get married is more debatable. A universal requirement of 28 days notice could be a deterrent, but of course there could be dispensations for truly urgent cases. I also wonder how popular such a scheme would be amongst the host of buildings which are now registered for civil ceremonies. Might the wedding industry mount a formidable opposition to a people rather than places based system? And I wonder whether the proposed system would do much to solve the problem of unrecognized religious ceremonies, but no doubt Professor Douglas will discuss that. But it would solve the problem of humanist ceremonies and other ceremonies conducted by independent celebrants. And it would definitely make the whole system much simpler and easier to understand, which as a former law commissioner, I'm thoroughly in favor of. Professor Sandberg recognizes that there will still be many people in marriage-like relationships who are not in fact legally married. 
although some of them may believe that they are. So he also makes the case for the reform of cohabitation law along the lines of the law in Scotland or the rather more complicated scheme proposed by the Law Commission for England and Wales. The government has been dragging its feet on this, perhaps because the need for financial remedies when unmarried relationships break down is so obvious that they will be used and thus put further burdens on the already overburdened family justice system. Or perhaps because of the oft voiced fear that improving the rights of cohabitants will somehow damage marriage. In short, while I see much to commend in this scheme, I also see that it may encounter some formidable opposition, but perhaps unlike the past, not principally from the Church of England. Thank you. Well, thank you very much indeed for that um, reflective and thoughtful and quite probing response. I'm going to go immediately on to Professor Douglas so that we have a continuity of presentation. So Gillian, please. Thank you very much, Mark. Um, can I start by saying what a pleasure it is to have been invited to take part in this uh, launch for my former colleague, Russell Sandberg, and what an honour it is to do so alongside Lady Hale and Professor Mayer. And I want to add my congratulations to Russell and to Bristol University Press for having produced what I think is a really great example of uh, something that academics can produce. It's both scholarly but accessible, and it makes, I think, a, a very valuable uh, contribution to the current discussions regarding uh, weddings law. It's also a great example of Russell's own rigor, imagination and expertise as a legal scholar. Lady Hale has, has set the scene very, very well for me. Um, my, my position is perhaps a slightly less, um, uh, I wouldn't say Lady Hale was effusive, but, but I'm, I'm less effusive about the need for marriage law reform. Um, I'm certainly not uh, hostile to marriage. I'm going to be celebrating my Ruby wedding anniversary in two months time, um, having had a, a, a very simple register office ceremony, ceremony myself uh, all those years ago. Um, but I do note, and Russell sets out at the start of his book, the um, very significant decline in the number of marriages since the 1970s, down 45% amongst heterosexual couples, of course, and an even steeper decline uh, in the um, percentage of uh, marriages performed uh, through religious ceremonies, constituting only 22% of all marriages in 2017. So my first question would be, well, why has the government asked the Law Commission to spend its very valuable time and resources uh, looking at uh, this topic? Um, but as Russell uh, explains in his book, and as the Law Commission set out in their consultation paper, there is no doubt that the current law uh, is a real mess um, and certainly in need of radical modernization and simplification. And Russell sums it up as inconsistent, unprincipled and discriminatory. It stipulates different rules for different religious groups and it excludes certain religious and non-religious practices. And his focus in the book, as Lady Hale has outlined, is, is on two problems. First, the unregistered religious wedding, um, most particularly identified as a problem for the Muslim community, but by no means confined uh, to, to that. Um, and secondly, the non-religious weddings where the parties want the ceremony to be performed in accordance with their own preferences, uh, which don't fit the current uh, legal requirements. Now, the mischief that uh, Russell identifies in relation to both of these is discrimination. Um, but the, the ways in which couples in these marriages are discriminated against, um, I think, are different. Let's take uh, the unregistered religious marriage first. These are regarded as potentially problematic because they appear to leave the dependent spouse vulnerable when the relationship breaks down. 
most particularly the concern is about financial hardship because of the inability to access the matrimonial financial remedies uh, jurisdiction. It's the actor and Khan uh, problem. But it's worth noting that even though we've been talking about this issue for more than a decade, we still don't know the real scale of the problem. There are lots of estimates um, of the, the number of couples, particularly Muslim couples, who don't have um, registered marriages. In 2015, it was estimated that it could be up to 80% of Muslim weddings that were currently uh, at that time unregistered. Uh, a survey for Channel 4 in 2017 found 61% of Muslim women hadn't had a civil ceremony and the register our marriage campaign um, at that time referred to 100,000 people in the UK having unregistered marriages. But we don't know how many Muslims marry in the course of a year. And um, many scholars, including uh, Dr. Rajnara Akhtar, uh, Dr. Rahana Parveen, Dr. Vishal Vora have pointed out that even if the majority of Muslims are entering into unregistered marriages, it doesn't follow that all of them are unaware that these aren't legally recognized. It doesn't follow that all of these marriages will break down. And it doesn't follow that financial hardship will inevitably result if they do. So while we can accept that there's a problem here, um, it is important not to make assumptions about its scale or to assume victimhood based on, on possible stereotypes. So most importantly, as Russell emphasizes, where such marriages are entered into voluntarily and wittingly, that's a free choice which should be respected. And his focus and that of the Law Commission is rightly, therefore, on where there's a lack of awareness that the formal requirements may not have been complied with. And I make the point which I've made before, and Russell also uh, picks up, that uh, we shouldn't assume that access to the matrimonial financial remedies jurisdiction um, would, would necessarily produce um, a better financial outcome. Uh, only a third of divorcing couples uh, make use of that jurisdiction. You don't have to have an order to resolve your finances on divorce. Um, the courts are not keen to encourage more people to take proceedings through the courts. Um, and I would imagine that for observant um, adherence to Islam, Judaism, uh, there may be a wish to um, comply with um, the, the religious prescriptions for finances. And there would be nothing in the law to prevent couples from doing that. So we shouldn't assume that recognizing more uh, religious marriages as legal will necessarily improve the financial position of vulnerable divorcees. Non-registered, uh, uh, sorry, non-religious unregistered marriages, I think, are different. Um, it's estimated there's about 11,000 of these, um, including a thousand humanist weddings. That's just about 6% of the total number of civil marriages. Um, more to the point, though, there's no evidence to suggest that couples who go through those ceremonies are um, uh, subject to the same potential vulnerability as may be the case with uh, religious uh, marriage ceremonies. There's no suggestion, you know, other than the cost of having two ceremonies, as Lady Hale has mentioned, or being tied to the uh, remedies for cohabitants, there's no suggestion of particular financial disadvantage. And there's a, a further distinction, I think, to be drawn between these two mischiefs. Um, but parties who adhere to a religion, um, particularly Islam or Orthodox Judaism, are in practice living under pluralist legal regimes. Um, they're living in minority legal orders, as my colleague at King's, Professor Malaya Malik, has described them. Uh, for them, the rules of the religion are just as, and of course, in practice, usually more binding than the civil law. The study that Russell and I did with our colleagues at Cardiff uh, a decade ago into religious tribunals made this point very clear. 
people who went to tribunals for a divorce or an annulment were doing so because they wanted to have the license to remarry within their faith. A civil wedding uh, would not have satisfied uh, their, them or their community. Um, and that was the importance to them uh, of, of um, using that, that forum. And that kind of, of, of dual need uh, is not really present uh, in the context of uh, non-religious unregistered, unregistered ceremonies, um, particularly those that are to do more with the preference for, for what goes into the ceremony rather than adherence to, to a sort of a belief system uh, like humanism. Now, for religious re uh, sorry, for historical reasons, of course, we don't have recognition of civil, uh, of religious divorces. Um, so those couples who do need a religious divorce or annulment, if they do have a legal marriage, of course, they have no choice other than to go to the civil courts to get their marriage terminated. Um, as Russell describes it, uh, when we look at divorce, there's a secular starting point and an equal playing field. And my position thinking about this is that, you know, if we were starting from scratch, we should do exactly the same for weddings. Uh, we should adopt the system that applies in France or Belgium or Turkey for a mandatory civil uh, wedding procedure, a ceremony or a registration, which the parties can then choose to supplement with a religious or non-religious ceremony as they wish. Registration is something that Rahana Parveen has advocated in her chapter in the book Cohabitation and Religious Marriage in respect of, of Muslims. Um, and I would suggest that it's worth exploring, would be worth exploring uh, for all marriages. It would be so much simpler um, than having to determine who can be an authorized officiant as the law commissioner suggesting. Um, it would mean that you could, you could guarantee, subject to any sort of bureaucratic uh, errors and omissions, uh, that the state would determine who is married to whom. Um, what a shame that we don't have a French revolution that would enable us to, to, to go from there, because I do recognize that uh, that's not practical. Uh, it wasn't part of the terms of reference for the uh, Law Commission, uh, and it wouldn't um, uh, find political favour. Um, if it's going to be hard enough for the Law Commission's ideas to, to get traction, um, I don't think my, my suggestion of uniformity uh, and, and, and state recognition uh, for, for, for marriages would, would work either. It would also probably mean that fewer people would get round to registering their marriage. Now that wouldn't matter, of course, if we had an adequate law governing intimate relationships outside marriage. And so I, I absolutely agree with Russell's view uh, in his book uh, that we do need to try harder to get reform for cohabitants um, so that there is a, a better way of resolving problems uh, when those relationships, there will always be some that fall outside uh, the wedding's law that they can be adequately uh, dealt with. Of course, the Women and Equalities uh, Committee of Parliament is now looking at that again. And uh, hopefully with the, the help of their specialist advisor, Andy Haywood, uh, they may make better progress than, than the Law Commission uh, did. After all, it's not as if our Prime Minister doesn't have um, experience of being a cohabitant. Um, in the meantime, um, I do congratulate Russell again on this book, which I'm sure all policymakers uh, will find extremely useful uh, and very thought provoking. Thank you. Julian, thank you very much. I, I, I'm sure not many of the people who've tuned in this evening were expecting to hear you fermenting revolution during the course of your presentation. Uh, the implication that Russell has been lacking in ambition in his recommendations. But Julian, thank you very much indeed. Um, let's go straight north of the border, please, uh, and hear from uh, Professor Jane Mayer. Professor Mayer. Thank you. So coming third of the speakers, I won't spend too much time on, on, on repeating and just agreeing with what they have said, but congratulations 
to Russell. It, it really is excellent to see this book and, and to see a book which, as Julian said, speaks to the academics, but also to the policymakers. Perhaps my first reflection this evening is on how you never can tell with family law. Five, 10, 15 years ago, if you tried to get a group of people together, academics, family lawyers in particular, to discuss marriage, no one wanted to come. And how things have changed. I mean, this book, which we are discussing tonight from Russell, is, is only the latest to an absolutely burgeoning scholarship on marriage. And I have been just watching the numbers of participants click, click through tonight and people still queuing in the waiting room. And it really strikes me as pretty amazing that so many people want to discuss a topic which just a small number of years ago, family lawyers certainly thought was completely out of date. So I think that is really interesting and, and worth uh, noting. Now, my comments on, on the book, the proposals, this whole area of law are the comments of an outsider. My reflections are informed by the, the law and the experience of another jurisdiction. And while that's a jurisdiction which is very close in physical terms, as we know, it is very different, not in the needs and desires and experiences of their families, but in its family law system. And so I'm always conscious and somewhat wary uh, when commenting as a, a legal outsider. And I'm very conscious of the fact that what works in one system may not fit smoothly into another. But with that note of caution, I can say that I, I certainly welcome and see great merit in the proposals for reform, both the proposals of the Law Commission that have emerged so far and now the the uh, further developed proposals which uh, Professor Sandberg has put forward. I welcome those proposals for reform, of both the law of weddings and the combination of those reforms with the introduction of some statutory rights for cohabitants. Be while some of the detail is different from the Scottish system, what is being proposed for Eng England and Wales is broadly similar to what already exists in Scotland. And perhaps, therefore, some evidence from a close comparative neighbour can help to inform at a time of proposed change, perhaps can help to inform and reassure on what might work. So looking first at weddings and the legal framework for the solemnisation of legal marriage. Now, in Scotland, since the Marriage Scotland Act of 1977, we have had a system to regulate the formation of marriage, which is broadly similar to what is now being proposed. It focuses very much on the, on, on the giving of advance written notice and on good documentation. And it also focuses on the authorization of individual celebrants, however they might get there through different routes. But it focuses on advance notice, sorting out the problems in advance and authorising the, the celebrants. And it does so, I think, and it brings the benefits of, uh, and Lady Hill referred to this, it has the benefits of hopefully sorting out issues of capacity and formal ceremony, etc., in advance. It does this through the submission of a notice of intention to marry, and then the preparation of a single document, the marriage schedule. And it's that marriage schedule which gives legal authority to whichever celebrant it is who conducts the marriage. That marriage schedule is the key document. It's the one that gives legal authority to proceed. So the paperwork, I think, is very, very important. Focusing on the authorization of the individual celebrant, the Scottish system also has the benefit of being reasonably flexible. And it has allowed, over time, for a diversity of ceremonies and individual celebrants to be legally authorised to conduct marriage. Now, in its original form, um, and again, as, as, as it is recounted in the book, the 1977 Act provided for two forms of marriage ceremony and two broad categories of celebrant, the civil and the religious. In 2005, uh, Humanist Society Scotland was able to secure authorisation of one of their celebrants under these relatively broad terms of the Act. 
And the rest, so far as marriage law, Scot Scottish marriage law, and in fact, the Scottish tourist to marriage industry goes, is, is history. By 2014, humanist celebrants had become so well established that the 1977 Act was changed to reflect formally what was already happening in practice. And we now have a situation where the category of religious marriage has become a sort of dual category of religious or belief. And as Russell highlights in his book, belief ceremonies in Scotland now outstrip religious ceremonies and are close in number, very close in number, to civil. It's perhaps also worth just noting as well that in many ways the Scottish system is more flexible. There is, and there has been since, well, since 1939, a distinction between civil and religious marriage. But even there, that distinction is nowhere near as, as, as strict or, or as rigorous as the one that I understand applies in England. And, and I've noted with interest just over the last few years how civil registrars more and more are, are, are advertising the fact that in a civil marriage, you can have your day however you want it to be. And so Lady Hale may have been lucky with her uh, civil registrar all those years ago. In Scotland, civil registrars are now really promoting that. And, and there isn't even that distinct separation. You can have some religious music in your civil marriage if you want, and depending on, on individual agreement. So I think that just to to say the, a little bit about, about the Scottish uh, marriage system and, and how it has worked in practice. In Scotland since 2006, we've also had some statutory rights for cohabitants on the breakdown of relationships. And that is the other part of uh, the proposals which are put forward in this book. Um, while they arguably have been an improvement on nothing and nothing is what we would have in Scotland without them, because I think it's really important to always stress that in Scotland, we don't have this fallback on other equitable property remedies. In Scotland, if you're a cohabitant, it's the statutory rights or pretty much nothing, um, possibly a, a claim in um, restitution, but, but, really, uh, but really nothing. So since 2006, we have had some statutory rights for cohabitants. And as they, while they are arguably an improvement, they do not work well, they have not worked well. So while our marriage law has been a success, uh, the cohabitation rights have not. Um, and that is now very evident in the fact that they are currently being uh, reviewed by the Scottish Law Commission. And uh, my understanding is that we will have uh, some draft, uh, a draft bill by the end of the year reforming the cohabitation rights. So having them in principle, good idea, how we did them, it's not working. So coming from a system then which already operates a version of what Russell is proposing, his proposals are for me a relatively easy sell. Nothing is ever perfect, uh, particularly in the chaotic world of family law, but it seems to me that these proposals would work. They would be simpler than the currently highlight, highly complex framework, and if it's complex to insiders, it's, it's almost incomprehensible to outsiders like me, they would accommodate individual desire for choice and combined with some statutory rights for cohabitants, they would mitigate perhaps the harshest consequences of unregistered marriage. Now in framing proposals for reform, and this is something that's already been stressed by the previous speakers, I think it's always wise to be pragmatic and to focus on the art of the possible. But from the perspective of the Scottish system, which already has in place a version of what is being proposed, I can perhaps afford to be a little bit more ambitious and, and to, to fantasise a, a little. So if I can step beyond the constraints of what might be achievable in terms of, of law reform for a moment, I would suggest that there are perhaps some even more fundamental questions which need to be asked. And at various points throughout the book, I think Russell has said, we need to step back and ask some fundamental questions. I would just like to suggest perhaps another, another two fundamental questions, even more fundamental, which I think need to begin to be asked and a more radical reform, which we should at least begin to consider. The first one 
is what is the interest of family law in, in marriage ceremonies, in weddings? When we think about who may celebrate and what is required from the officiant, as lawyers, policymakers, and reformers, perhaps we should not be too distracted by the attractiveness of choice. Couples can celebrate their commitment in whatever way they wish, um, certainly in Scotland, but what is it that lawyers and administrators want or need from a marriage ceremony? And the answer, I think, is certainty. And if that is the case, then it probably makes little difference what the celebrant or any associated organisation believe. The words of the ceremony and the meaning of any belief system behind it is probably not a matter for family law. Or, or is it? I sometimes wonder if the meaning of marriage, which is now largely absent from family law and certainly largely absent from Scots family law, if the meaning of marriage is actually maintained through the meaning of ceremonies and the celebrants who provide them. <coughs> so my first question then is, what is the interest of family law in marriage ceremonies? Because I think it's a question that we need to address to underpin the, the sustainability of, of long-term reform. And the second fundamental question I think we need to address sooner or later is what is the relationship between a wedding and a marriage, a ceremony and a way of life? Because if we don't address that question, then the distinction between legal and non-legal weddings, between formal marriage and informal cohabitation becomes increasingly difficult to rationalise and to sustain. And I say that from the the perspective of a system which now allows really extensive choice and also is trying to provide separate rights for cohabitants. By focusing on increasing choice when it comes to wedding ceremonies, I think we, list, we risk losing sight of whether that choice of ceremony has anything to do with the choice a couple is making in respect of the commitment of their relationship. In other words, are weddings in any way a reliable signifier of commitment? Family law at some point needs to con confront what a difference a day makes. To decide whether that big day gives rights to those who live as husband and wife, or those to, de to decide whether family law gives rights to those who live as husband and wife, or those who have managed to organise the wedding. So from the perspective of another jurisdiction, which, as I said, already has and has had for some time a system similar to what is now being proposed, I welcome these proposals. And I think I could give some reassurance that probably they will work. But I would caution that the more choice there is in terms of weddings, the more urgent the question becomes of where weddings sit within the legal regulation of intimate adult relationships. Julian, thank you very much for that, both for your information, which uh, a, a lot of us would have no knowledge of regarding Scotland, but also for your gentle words of reassurance uh, as we go forward. Um, participants in this meeting would probably not guess that I've spent the last few weeks behind the scenes encouraging our three panellists to put the boot in, and none of them have, which is incredibly disappointing. Uh, so you've had an easy ride, Russell, but it's now um, your opportunity to answer other points made by the panellists and to say a little bit more about the content of your book. Professor Sandberg. Thank you very much indeed, Mark, and thank in, thanks indeed also to the free speakers this evening. I, I don't know about uh, free lions on a shirt, I'd much prefer free lawyers on a Zoom call. Um, and I'm also thrilled to see such a turnout uh, this evening as well, because it underscores the importance of the book's subtitle, The Need for Reform. And as Mark said in his introduction, that's what this book is all about. It's designed to help provide that impetus for the need of reform alongside the forthcoming work um, of the Law Commission. And reform is needed not simply for reform's sake. It's not just a question of trying to make the law neat and tidy or even accessible. It's needed because of the injustices that exist under the current law and the injustices which are faced by people. Because the simple fact is, as we've already heard this evening, 
marriage law in England and Wales has failed to keep up with the social reality. Many relationships now are outside the law. And Baroness Hale outlined those two groups which the book, are con book is concerned about, the non-religious marriages and the unregistered uh, religious marriages, as I call them. And Professor Douglas is completely right to say that they are different issues. It's also a different gap in terms of the law. In terms of non-religious marriages, so marriages conducted by humanists and other belief organizations, and marriages conducted by independent celebrants. The problem there is that English marriage law currently provides no means at all by which they can be legally binding. In comparison, in relation to unregistered religious marriages, where people undergo a religious ceremony that doesn't conform with the law as found in the Marriage Act 1949, it's not that those marriages cannot conform with the Act. The way in which the Act functions is that all religions um, can have marriages, uh, adherents of all religions can have marriages that comply with the law. The difficulty is the thresholds, the arbitrary thresholds, which are put in the way of religions other than the Church of England, Church of Wales, uh, Quakers and Jews where there is a need for the marriage to take place in a registered place of worship. And the book argues that, that discriminates against those religions that may not have a building or those faiths that have a tradition of marriage outside of that particular place of worship, to marriage in the home or marriage in another uh, community centre, for instance. In both scenarios, until and unless the couple undergo a separate civil wedding ceremony, their marriages are not recognized by state law. Uh, this means they cannot seek redress from the state if their relationships break down. They're in the same position as cohabiting couples. And that's why these two topics are fundamentally linked in terms of marriage reform and uh, the introduction of cohabitation rights. And the key point here is that many are unaware of this. And even those who are aware, it is a considerable inconvenience in terms of cost and also in terms of emotion. Who, after all, describes their wedding as the happiest days of their life? Plural. So the book is very much about the need for reform of intimate adult relationships in order to recognize non-religious marriages and to reduce the number of unregistered religious marriages. But again, Gillian's right, we need to be more precise here. A, a number of uh, official reports uh, on this topic, and there have been quite a few in the last decade, give the impression that unregistered religious marriages are a bad thing full stop. That's not the argument in this book. What I'm arguing, as Julian indicated, is that unregistered religious marriages are unobjectionable where they are a voluntary and witting choice by both of the parties. So the role of the law to get involved is where it's not a voluntary equal decision, where it's not witted. And this reflects the way in which there are several reasons why um, people have unregistered religious marriages. It may be actually the choice of the parties. And in some religious communities, religious marriages effectively allow the couple to date, to, uh, to be together in an unchaperoned state. It may be because the couple are unsure of the law. And that's where it begins to be a problem. Or it might be because the law makes it difficult or impossible for them to comply. Because in their faith, they don't have a building or tradition of marriage in a building, for instance. That's where it becomes more problematic. So the book argues that there is a need for comprehensive reform of the law to modernize and simplify the law on who gets married. And I should make it very, very clear 
that in both aspects of the reform um, that I'm putting forward, as all three speakers have noted, uh, the book is building on the work of the Law Commission and the ongoing work of the Law Commission. Um, the Law Commission, in relation to getting married, published their consultation paper last September. Uh, it was literally uh, the second week of writing on the book. Um, so it, this, this was um, a little bit of a gamble, really, but I started writing the book not knowing what the Law Commission uh, was going to say. And the Law Commission report came out slightly earlier um, than I anticipated. Um, and it's 500 pages long, which was basically my autumn, um, reading and trying to analyze it. And my head almost fell off, actually, as I was reading it, because I was nodding so much. Um, there's so much of the Law Commission's report, which is absolutely fantastic, and which, you know, I was concerned when reading it, um, but the book was simply going to go, just do what they say, it's great. Um, there are, however, some points of difficulty, um, and in particular, uh, the difficulty arises in relation to the expansion or the possible expansion to cover belief organizations. I think it's worth just pausing a second to say what the Law Commission's proposal there is. The Law Commission's proposal, as it stands in their consultation paper, and like I said, they're currently working on a response to that, which we published, as I understand it, this autumn. Um, proposes this move towards the efficient system and proposes that there would be four or five groups of officiants. And the four groups are registration officers, those who are currently um, civil registrars, Anglican clergy, group two, nominated officiants from any religion or belief body, group three, and then independent officiants who could apply directly, group four. And there's also some provisions about maritime law in there, which I will confess went straight over my head. In relation to that third category, religion or belief body, and so the idea that any religion or belief body could nominate officials, this would make a considerable difference because that would remove the current discriminatory and arbitrary uh, provision that requires a building. However, where I differ from the Law Commission is that I think one of the small shortcomings and rare shortcomings in their report is how they deal with the definition of belief. Um, because the definition of belief is something which English law has struggled with in half a dozen different contexts in recent years. Uh, there's a very confused um, jurisprudence um, from employment tribunals and employment appeal tribunals about how the word belief is to be defined. Um, and having you know, spent a fair bit of time writing about that, um, I can see dangers in what the Law Commission is suggesting here because they suggest a definition of belief which is parasitical upon our current definition of religion, which comes from the uh, Supreme Court decision in Hodkin. And that's problematic because it defines belief as being secular. And I don't think that every belief necessarily is secular. It's also problematic because it doesn't actually tell us a great deal um, of how uh, that belief is going, to, how that definition works. And indeed, the Law Commission concedes this because they then also say that other thresholds will need to be met. There would need to be more than 20 um, worshippers, for instance. There would need to be a wedding service or a sincerely held belief about marriage held by that group. And to my mind, those thresholds are arbitrary and won't work uh, and will result in confusion and will result um, in a great number of um, groups potentially using uh, that provision in a way which the Law Commission doesn't um, foresee. The fourth category is also uh, slightly problematic in terms of allowing independent celebrants um, 
to be efficient and allowing a system of individual application. Because I argue in the book, once you start doing that, and I argue you should start doing that, but once you start doing that, then you suddenly have people who do not represent the state and do not represent a religion or belief having the right to solemnize marriage. And that then makes your third category look quite quaint. Because why would people try and get over that threshold in order uh, to, uh, why should religious and belief organizations try to get over that threshold uh, when independent celebrants, that threshold does not apply to them. So those are the main arguments of the book. I just want to say a few words in, in conclusion, and I'm aware that I'm right at the end of my time, uh, about the comments made uh, by the three speakers this evening. Uh, in relation to uh, Baroness Hale's um, comments, absolutely uh, support the idea that the focus is on what she calls uneven relationships. I also agree with her that the notice period might prove to be a deterrent for marriage, and that's something which I think does need uh, to look again at, uh, and also the effect of these reforms in terms of uh, the effect upon um, buildings. Um, there's a interesting dialogue between um, Baroness Hale and Professor May here, in that I think Baroness Hale is arguing for the Scottish system rather than the Law Commission system in relation to cohabitation. Um, whereas, uh, as we hear, Jay May points out, there are a number of defects um, of the Scottish system in practice in terms of cohabitation. And indeed, that's something which, yes, again, we definitely do need um, to learn from. In terms of Gillian's uh, comments here, if I can just pick out a few of the things um, which, which she said. Um, I think the reason why the Law Commission is focusing on this topic and why, to also to come to Jane's point of why family lawyers are now looking at marriage again, is because there are these weddings that do not comply with the legal framework. So the pluralism about uh, marriage. And that pluralism also, of course, means that the figures given about decline of marriage don't fully reflect the situation necessarily. Um, the other, one of several other really important points here is the, um, whether or not we could have a secular playing field for weddings in the set for marriage in the same way as we could have a secular playing field as we already have, sorry, a secular playing field in relation to divorce. Um, Gillian's right uh, in terms of, you know, that reform being not the art of the possible. Um, I think another factor to, to fit in there is what effect that would have upon the establishment of the Church of England with the assumption um, that there's a right to be married in the parish church, how, how that would fit in. And my concern here is I've got no problem with the continental system generally. What I have got a problem with is if it comes with the condition that there's a ban on religious marriages first. Because if there is a ban on religious marriages first, before the civil ceremony, then you're getting, you're devising a system that discriminates against those people who want to have a religious marriage in order to date, in order to be together in an unchaperoned state. Uh, to come to uh, Professor Jane Mayer's points, um, I completely agree um, with what she's saying about the risk of transplants and the need to learn from Scotland. And, you know, if this was a longer book, I think there would be room and, and space well deserved to go into more details on the Scottish system. Um, and indeed, um, it'll be very interesting to see what the Scottish Law Commission say and to feed that, um, not just into reform in Scotland, but to reform um, in England and Wales. I was particularly interested by the fact that he said that the system in Scotland led to registrars being more liberal, because there's quite a lot of evidence um, in England and Wales um, 
that civil registrars are being rather inconsistent, if I can put it diplomatically, with how liberal they are in terms of um, allowing religious contact, for instance, and also at the moment um, in terms of interpreting the COVID rules. Um, I, I, I'm very grateful to, to a number of independent celebrants on Twitter who highlighted this to me in terms of um, the extent to which this is proving to be a problem. Um, to come to, and I will conclude on this point, um, to come to Jane's two questions, I think what is the interest of family law in marriage is exactly what she said. It's that need for certainty, who is married to whom, and I would argue that the Law Commission are dead right on this in terms of saying that that can be achieved by focusing on the documentation, by focusing on the preliminaries, and then allowing um, liberalism in relation, a liberal approach in relation to how people do get married. And I would argue that at the moment there is not that certainty, because you know we all know people who say, oh, I got married last weekend on a beach, and you go, no, they didn't. Um, so at the moment, we're in the same type of situation, really, as the 1753 Act um, tried to cover of not knowing who is married in terms of who is um, legally married and who is not legally married, but thinks they are um, married. And it's worth noting there are certain legal rights where, you know, as if they're married will apply. Uh, in relation to Jane's um, second point, the distinction between married and wedded, that's absolutely um, crucial here, I think. And the issue is that at the moment, the social reality of the law on wedded is out of sync with the legal reality of the law on marriage. And that fundamentally um, is the point which this book is seeking to highlight and seeking to help push um, the need for reform. Thank you very much. Well, Russell, thank you very much indeed for speaking to your book and responding to some of the points and questions uh, that have been raised. Um, I want to move swiftly to the next phase of this uh, presentation to hear from as many voices as we can. And I've been following the chat box as best I can. Various questions were raised, but were then subsequently answered. So they have been deemed withdrawn. Um, but I can, I think uh, th th there are certainly three which I'd like to take as a clutch and then invite you, Russell, and any panelists if they wish to respond. Then I will look out for additional questions in the chat box and for hands raised. I want to take Neil Patterson's question first. Please be as brief when you speak as you are when you wrote the question. And then I'm going to go immediately to Jenny McKenzie and Rahana Parveen. When we've taken those three, we'll have a reflection from Russell and any panelists, and then I'll take another clutch of questions. So Neil Patterson, please. Thank you, Mark. Um, I will be very slightly longer. I mean, the question was, what, how do you define, or how does, should the law define cohabitation? And in particular, is it to be taken as it were automatically on the basis of simple occupation same house or is it done by some act that the couple do and if it's by an act that the couple do signing a register in what way is that different from marriage thank you thank you very much can i go straight to jenny mckenzie please for your question yeah just turn the video on there we go that should be working um, yeah, so I'm currently working on like a dissertation about Sharia councils and domestic abuse towards Muslim women and forced marriage is kind of a part of that. So I was wondering how this reform that's being proposed to marriage law might prevent forced marriages. Thank you very much. And um, um, Rahana Parveen, do you want to put your question as well? Oh, thank you to everybody. Um, yeah, it was just in relation to Russell just very briefly touched on it right at the very end of your presentation and um, the, the impact of COVID-19 and um, whether that has exposed even more so um, how problematic uh, our marriage laws are where uh, our marriage laws actually are. And I just mentioned anecdotally um, from my own sort of experiences of um, Muslim communities is that I'm, I'm aware that within the past year, Muslim communities and Muslims have continued to have nikah 
ceremonies often held in their backyards in their homes with very small ceremonies but have not stopped um, getting married um, and I, I wondered how you um, incorporated that into your work Russell, respond as you will to those three, and if Jane and Gillian and Brenda want to comment, they can, but there's no obligation. Excellent. They're three fantastic questions, and I could speak uh, at length on all three of them, but I will not, because I'm under strict instruction from Mark to get through as many as possible. So on the definition of cohabitation point, we've got a number of precedents in terms of the Scottish system, in terms of the Irish system, um, in terms of the previous Law Commission report and in terms of the uh, a number of private members bills that have been put forward, um, they all put slightly different tests of how do you define cohabitation. Um, but it's basically living together for a certain number of years or having children together and then a number of other tests to look at in terms of um, as a sense check on that. Um, and I would argue that's a an appropriate way of dealing with it. What's important is that it's an opt-out, not an opt-in system, because if it's an opt-in system, then you're right. It's you know the same as marriage law and would suffer from the same problems um, in terms of people being unaware of their rights, etc. Um, in terms of forced marriages, absolutely, um, this is really, really important. And the way in which these reforms would deal with it is by providing um, a sort of a backstop in situations where there hasn't been, haven't been, um, there is an equal playing field between the parties. And I do think the answer there is the cohabitation reform. Um, but the Law Commission does consider criminal offences. Um, and one of the areas where I differ from the Law Commission is that while the Law Commission talks about a new criminal offence, in the book, I talk about how you could modify existing criminal offences, and the law on forced marriage is one example of that, um, of, of, of how you could modify that and what changes uh, need to be there. Uh, in relation to the COVID uh, question, yes, absolutely. Uh, I think COVID has highlighted the problems that were already there in terms of marriage law in a couple of different ways. Um, the first way it highlighted was that um, when we first came out of the lockdown last summer, there was quite a lot of, um, there was quite a funeral about the exception for marriage ceremonies to take place because it talked about the solemnization of marriage. And so that excluded marriages which are outside the act, it excluded humanist and independent celebrants. And that was quickly corrected um, over months. So actually, the COVID response shows the state recognizing uh, these um, these ceremonies not as being legally binding but as definitely has taken place and also the issue more now is that backlog um, with the registrars um, and the fact that people are undergoing um, marriages outside the act but are not being able to then have a uh, book easily the civil ceremony to make it lawful. And um, there's a great piece written in the conversation by Rebecca Probert and Vizet Nara uh, a couple of weeks ago on that very point. Right, I'll stop there. Do any of the panelists want to comment? I will as assume from silence the answer is not. Jane, please unmute yourself and come in. Thanks, just quickly, I think the question that Neil asked about um, how, how you define cohabitation, I mean, I think that's that's one of the reasons why I would urge some caution, and that's one of the experiences from the Scottish side, because the definition of, of cohabitant in Scotland is, is a person who has lived in a relationship as if they were husband and wife. And of course, when we look at, well, what does it mean to be husband and wife? Well, what it means is you've had a wedding. So if you take away the wedding, you're left with very little. Uh, and so that is one of the real challenges. And so that the, the definition is something that uh, the, the, the Scottish Law Commission is looking at. And obviously there's never going to be a perfect uh, definition, but I think what it really shows up and, and, and this becomes a problem for the courts is you can see them struggling with this. They've, they've accepted that this couple are living together as if they were husband and wife. So that means they're cohabiting, but they're then left with this challenge of how to make some sort of financial provision 
which is not quite what you would get if you were married because we're still trying to maintain this difference. So I think the definition is really key. I don't know what the answer is because it's very, very difficult, but it certainly shows up the problems of just basing that definition on um, marriage. Uh, thank you, that's just what I wanted to add. The answer presumably will have to be worked out by the judges in case law as, as the law is applied on a case by case basis. Which is difficult. <laughs> Indeed. Um, there are two people who've been very patiently waiting with hands up, and I, I, if I take those next, then I can return to some of the material in the chat box. Um, Richie Thompson and uh, Megan Manson. Uh, Richie, can I go to you first, and then when we've had your comment, I'll move on to Megan. Thank you. Hi, I'm the uh, Director of Public Affairs and Policy at Humanist UK. I thought I might say something about uh, marriage statistics in Scotland since the change in the law there. Um, before the change in the law in 2005 to allow humanist marriages, um, the number of marriages was in decline, but since then it actually hasn't declined any further. Um, and indeed, the number of divorces has declined over that period as well. Um, now, obviously, I can't say that those two things are linked. Um, but one thing I can say um, is that interestingly in Scotland, when couples get divorced, they record what type of marriage they had um, and how long they were married. Um, and we got a hold of that data. We were actually able to see that couples who had four uh, who had humanist marriages um, were four times less likely to get divorced um, than other couples. Um, and again, obviously, I can't say for certain why that is. Um, there may be all sorts of reasons, like I imagine that couples who have humanist marriages might have been more likely to cohabit before they got married. Um, but I think from that, we can certainly say that humanist marriages at least aren't a bad start to uh, married life. Um, the change in law in Scotland, uh, in Northern Ireland as well in 2018 is also starting to see a similar rise in the number of uh, humanist weddings that happened there. Um, as one final point, I also just wanted to uh, clarify that um, there's there's been some use in the, la in the language of this event of describing uh, marriages by uh, what are often called independent uh, celebrants as non-religious marriages. But actually, of course, most of those marriages don't have, uh, most of those weddings, I should say, um, don't have anything to do with religion or belief. So they're not non-religious in perhaps the conventional sense of the term. They're more secular occasions that happen uh, perhaps because someone wants uh, a wedding uh, in a format that does, isn't currently allowed by uh, civil marriages that have to happen in approved buildings or that have to um, follow certain scripts. So I, I think as a point of clarification, it's probably worth being clear that those perhaps are not what most people would understand as quote unquote non-religious marriages. Thank you very much. Megan. Hiya, thank you uh, very much for an excellent uh, lecture. I'm really looking forward to um, reading your book. Um, I'm uh, Megan from the National Secular Society. I'm head of policy and research there. Um, firstly, um, I very much agree with a lot of what you've said, um, particularly on the issue of unregistered marriages. I think you have really um, nailed the issue, which is the restriction on religious freedom you have if you start trying to legislate against people getting married in a religious only ceremony, I think is absolutely a really, really uh, good point. Um, and of course, it wouldn't just affect Muslims either. There are members of other religious groups who opt to have a religious only ceremony. And if the state says, well, you're not allowed to do that anymore, then that could well be a severe curtailment of religious freedom. So thank you for um, pointing that one out. Um, however, um, the bit one, I'm a bit, um, less uh, I'm not sure uh, about is um, regarding independent celebrants. Um, I'm not too sure what the concerns are. Um, you said that it could render the idea of having um, uh, nominated religious officials quaint. Um, my response is what's wrong with that? Um, I don't see why an independent celebrant who's been trained by the state who has you know, basically is, is, is a, 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 measured as a good character, has, is, is, is monitored by the state, what the problem is with having that person conduct a marriage. I mean, the independent celebrants that are currently um, doing marriages, they love to, to do that. They, they're, they're in the business because they love giving people a tailored experience that is meaningful to them. Um, and I also think it could in, interfere with religion or belief if we didn't allow for independent celebrants, for those people who um, want, for example, a, a, a multi-faith wedding or a wedding that's very specific to their particular um, spiritual path. Um, so yeah, I'd love to hear more about, about your concerns about this. Thanks very much. Can I just tie up a third 
yeah. question in, 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 in with that, because Prakash Shah did have his virtual hand up for a while and then it disappeared. He's now come back into the chat box. And I think in fairness, Prakash uh, would like to hear from you. <clears throat> uh, would you like me to uh, say the question out loud, Mark? Yes, please. All right. Uh... Um, so uh, I was simply saying, uh, suggesting that it's pretty clear from the research that we have that the overwhelming majority of Muslims who don't register their marriages know that their marriages won't be marriages in English law. Uh, and of those who don't know that, uh, we have no idea how they'd respond to any change in English law. Uh, so the question, my question is, isn't the regular invocation of non, uh, uh, um, sorry, I should, I should have written, isn't the regular in invocation of Muslim marriages a red herring and uh, that any legal change will not have any significant impact on registrations. Thank you very much. There's quite, quite a hotspot of different items raised by those three questions. Russell, I'm going to go straight to you. And again, if any of the three panelists want to come in, the opportunity will, will be there. Russell. Thanks so much. Um, I'll start by um, clarifying the position on independent celebrants. I wasn't saying, and apologies if, if it came across, I was saying, I wasn't saying um, that independent celebrants shouldn't be legally binding. The book argues that their, their um, ceremonies should be legally binding. What my concern is, is that if you've got a system that allows independent celebrants, then you can't start putting rules on religion or belief organizations because you then create a level playing field whereby um, a religious or belief organization under the Law Commission's proposal would need to prove that they had 20 people, 20 adherents, whereas independent celebrants would not. So the solution I put forward in the book is to say absolutely independent celebrants should uh, be legally recognized, but we should do that by expanding our definition of nominated organization so that it's not just religion or belief, but it's any organization. And that then would allow the number of umbrella organizations that independent celebrants belong to, um, to nominate. And there would still be room for those truly independent, independent celebrants, if I can put it like that, to go down the individual route, but that route would be much less used, which would mean there'd be much less pressure on state, on on the state in terms of training them, etc. Um, to come back to the first question there about how they're classified, yes, um, that I think comes really to, to the nub of the issue, um, is that they are not non-religious in the sense that they are a form of religious belief. Um, but the way in which I'm dealing with the term non-religious is to deal with anything which is not uh, falling under the category of a religion or um, under the category of the state. Now, interestingly, in the book does look at, there are some jurisdictions whereby independent celebrants, um, and indeed, as, as you will no doubt know, humanist celebrants are recognized basically as uh, under the auspices of the state there. Um, on the final point of whether the Muslim marriage is a red herring, um, I agree. We don't, as Julian said earlier, we simply do not know the extent to which this is a problem. Um, and it might well be that uh, there aren't that many um, unregistered um, is, is Muslim marriages. And it might also be, and the book argues, that reform of marriage law will not solve that issue anyway. Uh, and this is why there's a need for both marriage law and cohabitation reform. Um, and we know that there is some issue, at least, um, because of the Akhetan Khan case and indeed um, other empirical studies. But I completely agree, there is a um, lack of an evidential base here, which, but by its, that's going to occur by its very nature, um, because we're dealing with, as the law commission points out, things which aren't currently being recognized and so counted. Thank you very much. I, 
I look in case any of the panelists want to come in. I think that they're rightly keeping their powder dry for their final word. Uh, so let me then, I think, take what will have to be the last little clutch of comments. Um, I'd like to hear from Stephanie Pywell and from Felicity Belton, and I might be able to take a third person if, um, if those two are brief. But can I go first to, to, to my colleague at the Open University, uh, Stephanie Pywell. Thank you, Mark, um, and thank you to Russell and all the panellists for an excellent, entertaining, interesting seminar. Thank you. Um, I just wonder whether Russell wouldn't require efficiency from the groups that he's talking about to undergo training that was as rigorous as he would require for independent, independent celebrants. So is he suggesting that groups would automatically be able to do their own training and accreditation? Thank you. And Felicity Belton, please. Hi, um, I'm speaking from the Scottish perspective, and it was something that was raised earlier, which was the force managed aspect. I just wanted to highlight that the 28 days delay in issuing of a marriage schedule is a useful tool in allowing celebrants to raise concerns about forced marriage, but also any kind of sham marriage or marriage of convenience. Thank you. And for completeness by the rule of three, um, I, I, I think Kelly Hawes has an interesting point to make from uh, personal experience. So Kelly, could I conclude by bringing you in to complete this batch of questions? Hello, yes, I was uh, just speaking from the side of the independent celebrants. Um, I think uh, that has been touched on again uh, and clarified a bit better, but uh, certainly, you know, we can fill lots of gaps as being able to put some faith in or no faith, and it comes back to the licensed venues as well. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, Russell, back to you to respond to those three. Thanks. Yes. I mean, in terms of independent celebrants, I think that to come to the third question first, um, I think part of the problem is the lack of um, research and knowledge on the area. And that's something which Stephanie's work has really, really helped with. And I would firmly recommend her two articles uh, published last year, both of which are cited in the book, which really do give an indication of what of the valuable role uh, that independent celebrants are filling. And also the point which was raised there of whether they are, uh, that they also provide a means to which you can then achieve an interfaith ceremony um, in a way that secular re registrars cannot. To uh, come to Stephanie's point about training, yeah, I, I mean, my instinct on this is that the training should be across the board. Um, and, you know, if we've got officiants who have a legal responsibility to do X, Y, and Z, which is what the law commission suggests, then they should receive the same training. And if that is being provided by a group, then that, that's fine, but that should be then monitored by um, the, the necessary state authority. And there is, I think, a in, in, in need for consistency there. And um, on um, the Felicity's point of the 28 days, yes, absolutely. That's, that's where I think, um, that's the delicate balancing act we, we, we need to walk down here in that if we start thinking about can we relax that 28 day limit um then we it becomes problematic from a forced marriage sham marriage uh, point of view and again you know um not wanting to come across exclusively here as a law commission fanboy what they suggest in their report on this I think is very, very sound in terms of a two-stage um, approach. Thank you very much indeed. Um, in bringing the conversation to a close, I said I'd allow each of the three panelists to respond in any way they see they saw fit to, to comments made, observations made, and reflections of their own. So uh, um, I suggest I go to those panelists in the same order in which they uh, that they spoke at the beginning of the session, with my apologies to Lady Hale for not being able to hear her opening sentences. But um, Brenda, can I go to you first for your for your final words uh, of reflection, uh, having heard the conversation? Well, it's been a fascinating uh, conversation, just as it is a fascinating uh, book. 
Uh, and I regret to say that I have not read the 500 pages of the Law Commission um, document, but perhaps I'll get round to doing that when I've got a little bit of spare time. My reflection, prompted by Gillian Douglas's comment, is that when we were thinking about what should happen to remove the discrimination between opposite and same-sex couples, when same-sex couples had a choice between civil partnership and marriage, whereas opposite sex couples didn't. We were all thinking in terms of, well, should we uh, give both of them the same choice or should we abolish civil partnership and make everybody get married? But of course, the alternative would have been, why don't we abolish, abolish legal marriage and just have civil partnership as the legal um, relationship? And then anybody can have whatever form of marriage ceremony they want or don't want because they've got their civil partnership for the legal consequences. I still think that's quite a sensible suggestion, not unlike the um, uh, Gillian Douglas's continental system, uh, but I do tend to agree that it's not in the realms of the possible, whereas these proposals just about are in the realms of the possible, which makes them all the more commendable. Thank you very much. I, I, I think your observation might be one of the, the, the sense that all bets are off. So um, let, let's focus on what's practical and achievable. So thank you very much for that. Uh, Gillian Douglas, please. Thank you. Um, well, it has been a really, really fascinating um, conversation. Um, I just wanted to comment on Prakash's um, point. Um, I, I tend to agree. Um, I do wonder how ready uh, imams uh, will be to uh, become authorised. Um, it does seem to me that the, um, the views of, of, of um, religious, religious uh, officiants, if you like, um, uh, that those who, who tend to, perhaps I'm, I can speak more from the Jewish community, um, who, who tend to try to keep apart from the state, I'm not sure that they would welcome um, a system uh, whereby they would, would wish to, to receive state sanction, as it were, as being authorised. But presumably it works in Scotland. So, so um, you know, that's, that's just a guess on, on my part. I suppose I, I do feel quite cynical. I'm, I'm, I'm so sorry, I feel I'm ending the evening on a slightly cynical note. Um, when I think of the amount of time and effort that people put into planning their weddings, um, that they will book their venues 18 months, two years in advance, of course it's been dreadful for them during COVID, um, and the care and attention that they put into all of this. Um, it doesn't seem to me that the, the fairly, fairly minimalist uh, requirements that the Law Commission are proposing um, uh, would would be problematic uh, in terms of encouraging people uh, to marry, and I, I don't think the 28 days would be a, a, an, an obstacle uh, to most people who were there. They they would you, you know that that just comes out in the wash really, um, and I think that Jane has nailed it really in terms of, of of a family law perspective. I think the questions that Jane raised. Um, speak to the need for us as family lawyers to, to really have a, a, a fresh think about what we think the principles of family law uh, should be. And from that flows the question of whether we have a marriage law, a civil partnership law, uh, a weddings law. Um, but thank you for, for allowing me to take part in this really great evening. Thank you. Thank you very much. And, and Jane, finally, can you lift us from that note of cynicism? Well, I don't know. <laughs> Other than to say, I, I, like, I love nothing better than the opportunity to spend all of this time talking about marriage with lots of other people that want to talk about it. It's been really fantastic and very, very stimulating. I think just one maybe thought from me, and I don't know whether this lifts it or not, and it kind of follows on from what Gillian was saying, but also what Lady Hill was saying earlier. We've talked a lot about discrimination, and I think one of the issues of discrimination that perhaps we don't talk about so much in terms of weddings and then uh, as a result access to the legal framework that comes with marriage is discrimination based a, a kind of economic um, a, and, and social discrimination and one of the things that I, I find very interesting is the more and more that we focus on, on the wedding as this, this event 
which requires so much preparation, the, the more it may be put out, out of the reach of couples who, who may want to, to be married and to have those benefits, but perhaps for, for, you know, for very good reasons, can't afford it or put it off. Now we know that legally it costs very little to get married, but as the wedding becomes ever more important, um, I, I, that, that's another element of discrimination that I worry about. So I think whatever the proposals and whatever reform comes out of this, making it simple is really, really important and making it something that people can access if they want to have the legal benefits of being married, a simple and cheap system. They can add on whatever extras they can afford, but, but at heart, it needs to be something that's accessible. Otherwise, I think there's another form of discrimination. Thank you very much. Last word, Russell. Thanks so much uh, to all three. Um, yes, absolutely. The economic factor is something which I think should be at the fore here and would be recognised by accessible uh, and simplified law and marriage. And Gillian's also right to raise the readiness of religious leaders. And again, um, a simple, accessible legal framework would help with that. But there's a need um, for dialogue and there's a need here for education and outreach as well as um, legislation. But I'd just like to conclude um, with a few, well, actually, I'd like to conclude with a confession, because there's a lie on the spine of this book. And the lie on the spine of this book is this just got my name on it. And it's not solely my work. Um, numerous people over numerous years, uh, dating back uh, to that empirical research project with Julian, Norman, Sophie, and As Asma, uh, 10, 12 years ago, whenever it was, numerous people uh, and numerous conversations have fed um, into the book and fed into the argument. And I'm very grateful to numerous people who have had uh, conversations with over the last year, several of which are here tonight, and that's um, really great to see. Um, I'd also like to thank um, those who read the book in advance, uh, Frank, Patrick and Sharon, uh, and also Bristol University Press, who have done a fantastic job. Um, and, you know, usually I'm a grumpy git, and the fact that I haven't been grumpy with them uh, shows that they have done an exemplary job, and I'd recommend working with them to anyone. Um, and in relation to tonight, I'd like to thank uh, Mark Hill uh, for um, coordinating and moderating the event and the Ecclesiastical Law Society for hosting and of course our three speakers and everyone who's attended. Because in a sense, now the real work begins because this isn't about a book which is published and then put on a shelf. This is about a movement for reform to bring uh, marriage law in line uh, with the 21st century norms. And there'll be opportunities in the autumn, given the Law Commission's report, given the consultation on um, extending the now temporary rules on outdoor weddings and approved premises. So really my message um, to everyone uh, who has attended this event is thanks for the interest. Let's keep that interest up and persuade politicians and policymakers of the importance of the subtitle of this book the need for reform. Thank you all very much indeed. Thank you very much, Russell. That does bring things to a close. It's a marvellous book. I think it couldn't have been launched any better than the conversation, the dialogue we, we have had uh, this evening. Um, we speak about the wedding feast. Lady Hale has shared reminiscences of the feast she enjoyed on her wedding, but we've dined well on the intellectual input and the conversation that we've enjoyed. So on behalf of everyone who's taking part, my thanks go to the panellists, to Professor Mayer, Professor Douglas and Lady Hale. Thank you for making this evening such a special evening and for giving this launch um, the, the, the impetus it rightly deserves. Thank you all very much. <laughs>